Hello, thank you, Yang, for the introduction. Um, it's great to be here and to have this discussion with you guys. I'm Gianluca from Venice, Italy. Probably you will see on how I move my hands. And um, I am an engineer at heart with a rooted background in economics. I've been in the digital environment for over 20 years, leading teams and companies. Now I am the CEO of Venice Swap, a crypto trading company based in Lithuania. And I'm happy to tell you uh, that last uh, week uh, we just closed the deal of a uh, hundred million dollars uh, with the global emerging markets uh, a, um, international investment fund uh, with operations in New York, Paris and the Bahamas and uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here and discuss with you guys. Excellent, thank you. Andreas? Hello, hi everyone. Um, good to be here once again. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Andres Maticolonis. I work at uh, Quonota Investments, a uh, family office based in Cyprus, as well as Sengotar Fund Management, a wealth management uh, office uh, based in uh, Zouk in Switzerland. Um, with the Cypriot company, we have a uh, keen interest in blockchain investments, so if you have any projects in line, please come and find me. We also have a nice portfolio of NFTs. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, CryptoPunks and uh, Land on Sandbox and many more. And also we have some affiliate companies, uh, travel agency, where we also accept crypto if you are interested. So if any of you are traveling a lot, please come and find us. You can use your crypto, no problem at all. And uh, with the Swiss company, uh, we have a crypto fund. It's a passive fund yield fund where we accept deposits again i can give more information on a later stage and probably you need to sign the uh, quite of um, for, uh, form first before i disclose any further details uh, i'm glad to be here once again and i look forward to any questions from your side thank you thank you and uh, andreas uh, also published an article in successful business i really recommend it and oh um, yes of course, don't Thank sell you yourself very short. Much. Yes, uh, indeed. You're talking about Web3, NFTs, up. and everything. <laughs> and um, I would like to introduce the last uh, panelist. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dagmara Hanslik. Um, I've been in the uh, fintech marketing industry for uh, more than 12 years. Uh, now I join the um, crypto uh, blockchain space for its fast uh, paced growth, um, innovation, revolutionary solutions. Uh, vibrant community and just endless possibilities of growth. Um, as visionary people uh, support ambitious projects, I join uh, Polkadex as their head of marketing. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Um, I would like to stay with you, Dagmara. Um, can you explain what is DeFi and what is uh, aiming at? Yes, DeFi, uh, decentralized finance, uh, aims at providing um, the same or better financial services as uh, traditional finance does, but without central authorities or a need for any intermediaries. It's uh, meant to be open to public, uh, easy to access with less barriers to enter. And essentially it allows uh, everyone to participate in financial markets while keeping uh, full control of their funds at all times. Um, now, the term was born in 2018 and sparked in popularity in 2020. And as everything in this fast-paced environment, it evolved uh, quite rapidly. So now what we are uh, witnessing is uh, a transition of DeFi into to DeFi 2.0 uh, that tackles uh, the flaws that the first phase didn't manage to, to address while leveraging on the strengths and giving uh, participants more uh, freedom and independence uh, through, uh, for example, governance protocols, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations that give, give uh, an option for, uh, for network participants to vote and essentially decide on the future of the uh, project. 
Okay, great. And um, Gianluca, can you also talk about the disruptive factor of uh, DeFi? Because uh, if I'm right, in 2017, when I started in the cryptos, uh, I did not even know what DeFi was. It was almost zero. And now the TVL, for instance, is almost 100 billion uh, total value locked. So it's quite uh, good. Can you tell me uh, a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, DeFi is a new economic financial paradigm uh, that is connected also with an idea of freedom, actually. Uh, you know, um, some sort, uh, it is uh, a, a sort of revolution uh, because people are free to interact uh, within one another or within uh, uh, providers of uh, financial services uh, without an intermediary. And actually, yes, the, the, the term, the word uh, was uh, started uh, in 2018, but probably the, the, the same... The same concept of DeFi started all with Ethereum and their smart contract because, you know, any financial uh, transaction is uh, uh, conducted through a contract. And if this contract is smart, it is deployed on the blockchain, it is uh, DeFi in its purest form. So, uh, actually, it is the same Ethereum that changed the, the environment. And now we are seeing this evolution. Uh, with the figures that Jan uh, mentioned, and uh, uh, we are looking at the future and, uh, and in the interaction with other institutional players, probably in the next future. Yeah, Andreas, and what are uh, the areas uh, of uh, DeFi, and can you mention also some interesting uh, projects at this moment? Of course. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, automatic mar market makers. Maybe yes, maybe no. Swaps, Uniswap, SushiSwap, PancakeSwap. So that's uh, one, uh, one very frequent tool is used by the users. Uh, we can also see now uh, extensively, there's a new concept of uh, gamify ga and game finance, where we have the play to earn um, concept. So users, uh, gamers usually at the beginning, they play games and there's a way to monetize. And actually this is picking up a lot at this stage. Um, at the same time though, we have platforms where they uh, started uh, providing services like borrowing and lending so people can uh, use their asset and do this type of uh, actions with uh, their peers. So it's peer-to-peer -peer, uh, borrowing and lending platforms. We also have synthetic assets. So what's synthetic assets? Uh, we, it's a combination of uh, traditional derivatives with blockchain. So essentially it's a tokenized derivative. You can trade traditional derivatives on blockchain. Um, and then, for example, there are projects like uh, Melt Protocol, if you're familiar, is uh, being built on Cardano blockchain. This, uh, the team behind Melt is trying to um, build the new banking system based on this specific protocol. Then we have um, Maladex. Um, it's uh, an exchange or platform, let's say, that will uh, provide several functionalities, again, on Cardano blockchain, and uh, will allow to tap into the traditional world and the world of blockchain. And, of course, um, I, as uh, my fellow panelists said, the previous uh, panels, we see a lot of uh, new developments in the real estate where we are going to see real estate uh, tokenized. And uh, this is actually very big because using DeFi and also using assets that have a specific value, you'll be able to use the asset and uh, borrow on the value of the asset. So instead of going to the bank, and put your house there. You can actually tokenize your house, put it on the blockchain on these different platforms, and then get a certain level of loan on your asset. Thank okay, you. Uh, Gianluca, would you like to add something uh, on what Andrea said? Okay, um, um, uh, we can talk about, for example, uh, the, the automated market makers. And, uh, you, you know, automated market makers, uh, are uh, sort of uh, programs uh, running on the blockchain that uh, um, start, uh, set prices and execute trades in an automatic way. 
they substitute the, the order book on the centralized exchanges, for example. And um, why they can do this? Because they rely on pools. Uh, pools are, uh, liquidity pools are uh, a place where uh, investors uh, put their token uh, in couple, in pairs, and uh, this is uh, where uh, um, the trade uh, uh, happens. So, um, every transaction, for example, uh, requires a little fee, so the, the, the FI swap, the, the, uh, the centralized exchange can live, thanks to, the, to this, but also the liquidity pools take a little fee for each transaction. So, this mechanism is completely automated and uh, you can, uh, as a user, use it very simply because you need only your wallet and uh, uh, actually you don't need any KYC, you just install your MetaMask, uh, you create your uh, wallet address and you start uh, uh, using it. You can swap tokens or you can stake crypto, simply deciding uh, uh, to, to go for swap or for pool. So it's very simple, it's uh, dis completely disintermediated, and uh, in some sense uh, it is a new complete concept in the financial world. That's very nice. Uh, Dagmar, would you like to elaborate on this? Um, yes, uh, to me, uh, the most uh, interesting DeFi projects are uh, those that uh, address real problems uh, and pain points users are facing and therefore providing a value. And uh, one of example is, uh, is Polkadex. Uh, Polkadex was built uh, with an idea of bridging a gap between uh, centralized and uh, decentralized finance. In a nutshell, uh, Polkadex combines the best features uh, of DEXs and, and sexes centralized exchanges while eliminating uh, disadvantages of both. Um, we are building a non-custodial, easy-to-use, cross-chain, decentralized um, exchange with an order book that allows for um, high functionalities and um, advanced uh, trading tools. Um, it's like um, essentially you're using uh, Binance or KuCoin while keeping a full control of your funds at all times. Now, uh, Polkadex is not only exponentially faster, uh, more efficient and better looking than DEXs, uh, it also um, is meant to be interoperable and this is uh, thanks to uh, our uh, revolutionary uh, decentralized uh, Thea bridge solution, we, which was uh, launched to the public uh, testnet just this week. And uh, <clears throat> further on uh, interoperability, at the moment, uh, Polkadex is participating for the, uh, with their uh, crowd loan campaign to secure a slot on the uh, Polkadot uh, parachain. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Polkadot, uh, Polkadot is a zero-level uh, multi-chain that allows other blockchains, uh, level one, to connect as parachains and form uh, an ecosystem that allows uh, for seamless trans trans transition of data and uh, just the network to cooperate together. And uh, I'm proud to say that at the moment, uh, uh, we are the leading project in the, in the auction. Uh, as of this morning when I checked, we uh, crossed 840,000 dots, which is equivalent to like 12, I think, 0.7 uh, dollars, million dollars. Um, and what's, what's beautiful about it is that as the name suggests, Crowdloan, this is a community-driven uh, campaign. Uh, we have not only investors and, uh, and partners, we have uh, hundreds of uh, retail uh, dot holders who, uh, you know, were ready, who are ready to stake the dots, contribute to our uh, crowd loan because they believe in the project. They believe that uh, Polkadex will uh, provide them the solutions and tools that they are looking for. A nice full disclosure, I've got also a 
<laughs> Polkadot in portfolio, so it's uh, good to uh, stay with your platform. Um, yeah, it's very great to hear DeFi disrupting the traditional financial uh, sector. Uh, now we know what the possibilities are, but uh, what are the challenges? So what, in your opinion, is missing uh, in DeFi? Well, um, the blockchain trilemma, which is the problem of balancing between uh, decentralization, scalability, and security still remains. Uh, none of existing uh, networks managed to fully address it. Um, scalability, arguably, is the most important aspect of uh, any DeFi protocol. And uh, as of today, uh, Ethereum holds uh, nearly 80% of dApps decentralized applications, and this makes the, the network uh, fully congested, slow, inefficient, and just expensive. Um, so the other, the other problem is the fragmented landscape of, of DeFi. Uh, most of uh, uh, projects, they work uh, in isolation. They are limited by, by the boundaries of their own networks. There is lack of interoperability. And now, um, interoperability allows for an easy flow of, uh, of data uh, from one blockchain to another. If uh, there are constraints on, uh, on this connectivity, obviously, market liquidity is affected. And uh, this is a big problem for the DeFi space as of today. Hey, John Luca, do we have also some opinions of it? Yeah. Okay. Before introducing the issues of the present issues of DeFi, I must say that DeFi is the best position to solve them because we are talking about money, and where money is, uh, there are big pushes to, to solve the problems. Probably more uh, more quicker than, for example, you know, we know uh, the, the the issues, the tech issues we had on the social media. So mm, we are talking about uh, some. Uh, uh, connaturated uh, issues on DeFi. For example, uh, we don't have fiat money. Uh, another thing uh, is that uh, uh, there are, as uh, Dagmar says, uh, high gas uh, fees. Uh, another, another issue is the risk of impermanent loss and uh, no KYC, so no verification of the counterpart. So, uh, I would say that uh, these issues actually are the best uh, um, assurance we have uh, to, go, to give uh, DeFi a better future. Uh, probably uh, as regards the, the absence of fiat money, this will uh, help. Uh, and I think uh, that the, the time is the only, the only matter. Uh, will help uh, to um, accept uh, the, the old fashion players like banks to enter this market. Since we are talking about a market which started from 1 billion, now it's older, over 200 billion dollars in only three years. And uh, for sure, they will accept DeFi protocols. Of course, in their way, there it will take time, but it will happen for sure. There are too much money there. And uh, high gas fees. Uh, Dagmara already talked about it, so I, I won't uh, speak about it. Uh, it will be solved uh, from a technological point of view with interoperability and also maybe with Ethereum 2.0. And uh, as regards the risk of impermanent loss, we need the higher education. Uh, do your own research, guys. Absolutely. Once uh, you could trade it only with a license or you had to to uh, trust a, a broker. Now it's your money, it's your digital asset, so uh, trade it uh, uh, with uh, great uh, responsibility and uh, higher education. No KYC. Okay, this is not a problem for me because we have tools over there. We have uh, artificial intelligence risk monitoring tools that assure us and give us trust in our counterpart if we isolate the bad guys. And uh, uh, in a uh, previous uh, panel, they said only 0.05% of uh, the uh, entire volume of crypto is linked to money laundering. So it's much lesser than the fiat money. Uh, we have the tools 
for uh, give the maximum trust uh, to the file, and uh, I am sure it will be. About the um, money laundering, I think it's even less. Um, I read some um, publications that 1.5% of the total um, money laundering um, amount that is only used by crypto, so it's even less. Great. But uh, that's uh, just a short detail. Uh, Andreas, what do you think uh, is stopping DeFi from mass adoption and which problems they have to tackle? Yes, um, my fellow panelists already said the many technical uh, things. Uh, obviously, it's very important, yes. <laughs> but we also need to see what the user is actually using, right? So um, it's important to have uh, user-friendly uh, platforms. Um, we see a lot of um, expansion, a lot of uh, popularity in the forex industry because they have user-friendly platforms. They try to streamline their products in such a way that the client can go there, make a click, bet, whatever you name it, trade, and, and do the action. Uh, using DeFi, and especially because you have your own custody and you need to have certain level of knowledge to go there, log in with your wallet, so on and so forth. This still puts people away. So once we see more adoption from uh, current companies in the industry, but also companies that already exist and they are dealing with trading and they start implementing uh, several DeFi uh, protocols within their services. So essentially they create uh, new uh, products for themselves, but at the same time, bring the existing clients into this new industry, we'll see much more adoption. It's a process, and uh, alongside with the regulation, with the technology, and obviously with the right uh, companies, I'm sure we will manage to have a higher adoption and people will be able um, to use the services. And just to give a last example, is like a company that probably most of you are familiar with, Krypton.com. So this company managed to engage with so many people in such a short period of time because they brought crypto to the masses with few, three clicks essentially. So once we see this happening for DeFi, we will see a lot of DeFi projects used by um, let's say the average user, if I may call it this way, without even knowing that is DeFi. They just want to do a mechanism, they click on it, they do it, end of story. Thank you. Yes, and uh, Gianluca, what uh, will the future hold for DeFi uh, if they tackle all the problems and everything? Do you see a very bright future? Or if they don't uh, uh, tackle the problems that much, is the um, future grim? No, I see a very bright future, and I would like to, to talk about, for example, three different directions, among the others, of course, uh, that uh, uh, I will see in the DeFi future. First one is a sort of, let's say, institutional DeFi, uh, that means uh, uh, integration with the institutional players, banks and other old-fashioned players. Um, okay, the problem here is compliance, we know. But uh, we also know uh, that uh, even if uh, the paths uh, with uh, uh, compared to, to, to def how DeFi evolved are different, we know that uh, there are tools over there that uh, will let uh, these uh, old-fashioned players uh, use DeFi protocols. Another direction I would uh, stress out is uh, a sort of CDFI let's call it centralized DeFi, a sort of private DeFi uh, with smart contracts running on private blockchain. It will be limited and niche, of course, but it will be an interesting one since uh, many organizations could see this uh, uh, as a way to do their DeFi system and uh, we all hope uh, uh, with uh, interoperability uh, features, of course. Another direction, last one, uh, uh, I would uh, introduce is a sort of AML, AML DeFi. And uh, if I had to, to, to make a bet, I would put my money on this. Um, that means uh, a stronger control of source of funds uh, with integration of artificial intelligence and uh, risk monitoring tools like uh, Crystal Blockchain or TRM. Uh, in order to prevent uh, illicit funds uh, to use uh, 
defy system as a money washing machine. It's not happening, uh, we saw, but we have to be stronger in our future. And I think in this way, DeFi will have no limits. Okay, uh, Dagmara, would you like to elaborate on that as well? Yeah, what does the future hold for DeFi? It's probably a billion dollar question. <laughs> uh, I see it definitely bright and, and promising. To me, uh, the future, it's multi-chain. There will be more and more uh, networks coming to the space. And now the key is to make them talk with each other, to connect, uh, increase this interoperability, more interoperability, increase um, possibilities. Mm. Yes, we do need to uh, um, lower the entries uh, for uh, the mainstream to, uh, to enter the space. Um, but uh, definitely we need to work uh, hard as, a, as an industry on uh, working on those uh, projects and tools so that uh, the public, they can see it for themselves. Andreas, and how do you see the future for DeFi? Yes. Um... As we said earlier, it's important there is a way to use uh, DeFi, yes? So, except from this, uh, we also need to look at the governments, how this will uh, big organizations, let's say, as an as a ecosystem, will uh, react to DeFi. So, we already see countries like Canada, the UK, um, China exploring the possibility of having a centralized currency, CBDC, uh, central bank digital currency. Also, the first panel uh, mentioned this. So, what is this? It's essentially to introduce blockchain technology and um, issue a certain type of token that will be backed by its value, be backed by certain assets that uh, the government will have. Most probably we will see on a European level um, Euro stable coin, which will be issued by European Union. And it's important that is backed by value by the European Union. Maybe it's the countries, maybe it's just certain uh, central bank. Uh, we will see, we don't know yet. But what's important is that um, we started to see interest, obviously at the beginning, they were skeptical, but now we see progress after the other because blockchain technology has its benefits, as we all know, decentralization, scalability, security. And uh, alongside this, then we'll see the banks because the banks already offer financial products, yes, for many centuries now. Uh, by integrating blockchain into their uh, operations, they will be able to streamline certain of their internal processes, especially when they send funds uh, cross border or to each other, but also uh, to use these new financial products and offer them to their clients. So uh, possibly some DeFi based products can also exist through banks. We don't know, but we see strong interest. So uh, I think by educating people, by uh, uh, educating also the stakeholders behind um, blockchain, we will see a certain level of adoption and uh, time will show where this will lead us. But I think definitely the future is bright and alongside with the regulation, AML, technology progress, uh, for sure we will we'll see a lot of uh, um, increment in the services. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, what actually are the risks and uncertainties for participants like um, traditional companies and also for uh, users? All right, okay, yes, uh, risk. <laughs> Did you hear about the hack uh, this week or last week? Uh, okay, last, uh, who is familiar with uh, Bored Apes? <laughs> Andrew is who is uh, familiar with the uh, Axie Infinity game. Oh my God, here we go. So, <laughs> excellent. So last week, guys, um, we had, um, as I said, I mentioned before, play to earn. So there's a game on a specific blockchain. People are playing the game and they get rewards via token. So last week, there was a hack worth of $620 million on this blockchain. So many people lost their money. <laughs> so only this week, 
um, we had another hack of uh, a very famous project uh, with NFTs um, where uh, they had a bug at their Discord channel and uh, they lost about 13 million, if I'm right, just simply as that. This being said, though, because the product is so popular and people don't really care or they are not careful when they invest, the same project launched 55,000 NFTs, uh, which represent a piece of land on a virtual map, and these guys raised another 300 million. So <laughs> it's important that uh, investors, especially re retail investors, do their own due diligence. They need to know the project. Everybody wants to make money, but we should be careful and patient when we're trying to invest. Um, these are some risks. Um, I can also speak about um, um, the regulatory uncertainty we have. Um, we mentioned before, uh, uh, Cyprus, for example, has CASP license. It's a, it's a registration, actually, not a license. It's slightly different. So companies can deal with crypto, can provide services, depending on this type of CASP license you have. They can also issue tokens. However, if they go into the banks, they will not receive any service and most probably will get uh, blacklisted. Uh, and at the same time, the retail investor. So if you deposit with uh, your personal card to a company that is dealing with uh, crypto, your banker will phone up, hi, Andreas, hi, John, Sam, whatever. Why did you deposit that amount of money? We don't deal with crypto. Please don't do it again. This is what they are in, in um, this is what is their practice. This is what these people are being told to do. And they are doing their job, actually. But while the regulation comes in place and we, uh, and we go out of the gray zone, uh, it will be much easier and much better. So everyone needs to be careful when investing and uh, also do your own due diligence. And at some point, you also need to pay your taxes, of course. Yes, let's not forget this. So if you get involved, try to be logical, try to know what you are doing. And when the time comes, you'll take the right decisions, uh, depending on the legislation and obviously the region you are based at. Uh, Gianluca, I think that Andrew is getting hungry and also the participants here, the attendees. Can you um, also short few seconds uh, yeah. add something on this? Very briefly, uh, okay, apart from uh, hacking and risk of hacking and risk of losing money that are common to any financial uh, mean, um, let's talk a little about the risk of, uh, of, uh, of the industry. Uh, due to the um, ruin by the, the, the use of illicit funds. Uh, how do we move past these risks? Okay, first of all, with internal discussion like this, we as a community can create, uh, help to create uh, uh, common grounds, uh, uh, um, uh, terminologies, a self-regulated environment, uh, and uh, uh, help everybody moving towards a globally uh, coordinated uh, uh, regulation and uh, standards. Uh, after this, of course, uh, they will also move the, the, the regulators with external regulations, and they can also help us moving past this risk. But we have to be, just to conclude, uh, we have to be aware and uh, conscious that uh, risks are our best friend because they help us uh, improving our uh, ecosystem, our solution, and give uh, DeFi a brighter future. Thank you. Well spoken. Um, I would like to give the, op the opportunity one question, two questions. You're very generous, uh, Andrew. Two questions from the audience uh, for our uh, panelists. So if someone has a question, please raise your hand. Uh, in front there, uh, Andrew. Hello. Uh, hi, guys. Good uh, event again. Um, we've seen that uh, many blockchain technologies have uh, a lot of limitations, as you discussed. Um, what do you think is important from a technology perspective uh, for an ecosystem to have in order to uh, m assure investors that uh, when investing in DeFi, uh, tokens and everything 
um, should have. Um, I'm, I'm aware of uh, the Cartano blockchain, which uh, took the um, uh, scientific approach and developed their uh, technology uh, from a scientific perspective so that they can, at least that's what they say, to uh, create a blockchain that is, can be trusted, uh, it's secure, and, and, and scalable. Uh, what other aspects uh, do you see from a technological perspective are important? Um, I can uh, try to answer your question. Um, yes, uh, I, I think it's, uh, as mentioned before, uh, it's all about, uh, okay, the three concepts, the centralization, of course, security, but scalability, as you mentioned with Cardano. And this is uh, what we are uh, witnessing uh, the, the new uh, generation blockchains are aiming at. For example, uh, the Polkadot that I mentioned before, uh, the co um, the lead uh, developer of uh, Ethereum back then, uh, Gavin Wood, uh, he, when he was working on this um, Ethereum virtual machines, um, he knew that uh, Ethereum won't scale. That's why he uh, came up with, uh, with Polkadot. That's why, why it was born, because of unlimited potential on of uh, interoperability with other blockchains. The whole idea is that uh, Polkadot uh, composes of uh, 100 uh, parachains that they all work together. So scalability here is um, it's, it's the key. And thank you for uh, the question and also for the great answer. Um, last question, be quick, or otherwise we will hit for lunch. There we go. You're lucky. No, we're not going for lunch yet. We're going to have panels. Oh, panels. <laughs> okay. Here we go. It, it should be on, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Hello, my name is Polis. Um, I have uh, two very quick questions. One is that most hacks are being made through um, bridges. So if we want to move through DeFi in a safe way, what's the best alternative doing that instead of going through bridges? And the second question is, um, banks are kind of um, in another era, like Warren Buffett saying that he wouldn't buy Bitcoin if it was $25. And that's okay. So since you are on DeFi and you are setting new standards, why don't the, the good DeFi projects work together to become the new banks and leave the old to the old? Thank you. All right, we have a tooth against the banks, guys. Well, I, I guess I can take this question. <laughs> um, okay, regarding the, the bridge uh, question, you, this is the first way of... Um, you know, exchange token essentially from one uh, blockchain to another. Um, w we see projects developed that, for example, while tokens are locked into the bridge, you can also use them and generate uh, value out of it. So the locked value can be used. But in terms of security, uh, it's all about auditing audit, audit, audit. So we see many companies uh, popping up now that they do uh, blockchain security audit. Only recently, uh, I'm not gonna say the name, but a company um, was evaluated at one billion uh, two weeks ago and is like a few months old. So this is extraordinary. So it's a unicorn within under a year essentially. So uh, we will see many new services popping up and different type of uh, jobs uh, that will be related to this new emerging industry. And I'm sure more things will come out, how to predict the possible hacks. Uh, uh, yesterday I was reading about a project that uh, is using AI to read through code and uh, identify possible um, breach of uh, code essentially. So I think um, we'll see new mechanisms and new standards and I will not be surprised uh, to have ISO standard like we have in certain industries to have for this as well. I'm sure most probably it will be something related to code at this stage. I don't know. I'm not a 
developer. But uh, if this expands the way we are expecting it to expand, we will see certain level of certification, approval, so on and so forth. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's it. All right. Done? Okay. Let's give it up for the lovely panelists, Thank you, everyone. guys. Thank you very much. And have a great day and networking opportunities. See you later. Brilliant, brilliant panel. Thank, Thank you, you so much, guys. I wish I could spend the entire day with you. And it wouldn't be enough. <laughs> what, the champagne? We talk about it later. We had compliance. We had legal with us. We got to keep off the booze. We're not Forex companies, guys. Come on, remember. That happens in Forex. All right. Now, uh, we're not going to go for lunch uh, just now. We still have uh, two more panels to go through. They're going to be short panels and very interesting. I guarantee that because I know the panelists. Right. Thank you so much, guys. Real pleasure. Now, we spoke about uh, what's coming in the DeFi space and we heard the panelists. A lot of things are happening, but we have, um, uh, let's say, a, a roadblock, regulation. And since we started on the legal side this morning, we're going to continue on the legal side uh, today. So in the next panel, we're going to talk about the regulation of DeFi CeFi with the one and only Mihaela Grigoriu, Head of Financial Regulation and Advisory at AGP Law Firm. Let's give it up for Mihaela, everyone. There we go. Good morning. The stage is yours and so is the audience. Hello everyone, my name is Mihaela Grigoriu and I'm here today to talk to you about DeFi or DeFi, Decentralized Finance as we know it, which is the emerging phenomenon. Well, due to the delay that we are having and also because of the fact that my fellow speakers have already mentioned a lot of information on the subject, I will try to be as quick as possible on my presentation. So today, most of the financial transactions in the economy are digital. So why will we even need to replace the traditional financial system with a decentralized version? The answer is that DeFi refers to financial services on a public blockchain, mainly Ethereum, and under DeFi, the need of a third party involvement is eliminated and it empowers us to do most of the things that banks do. DeFi is global, it's a peer-to-peer, -peer, um, meaning directly between two people a transaction. And why is it important? It's because it creates an open, free market that is accessible to everyone that has an internet connection. So what are the benefits? It's open, you don't need to apply for anything or open an account, you just get an access by creating a wallet. It's ha it has a pseudonymization uh, feature. You don't need to provide your name, email address, or any personal information. It's flexible, it's fast, and transparent. So the use of DeFi via software called DApps, which are the decentralized applications, most of which currently run on the Ethereum blockchain, uh, where it's very easy and fast to, to use it, actually, because it's open, um, it's very easy to use. Um, so the, the protocols that, it's, that are being used are um, for, the for the traditional financial transactions, for the decentralized exchange, e-wallets, stable coins, yield harvesting, the NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and flash loans. DeFi uses cryptos and smart contracts to provide the services uh, to eliminate the need for any intermediaries. Since it is an open source, protocols and applications are open for users to inspect and also innovate with them. Here are some ways that people are engaging with DeFi today via lending through an instant uh, model, uh, getting a loan via trading, saving for the future, and also buying derivatives. So apart from the obvious benefits that it provides, it has also the risks and downsides with it. Uh, there is no apparent consumer protection. 
because um, DeFi has thrived in the absence of any rules or regulations. But this also means that users may have little to no uh, recourse when something goes wrong. We have the hacking fact where hackers are a threat because all of the decentralized finance potential use, uh, they rely on software systems that are vulnerable to hackers. We have collateralization. We have the private key requirements. Um, if you lose a private key, then you lose your wallet, you lose access to your funds uh, directly. So that's a risk, a very important risk. Let's have a look at what is CFI, centralized finance. CFI is a type of uh, financial practice within the cryptocurrency sphere where users current interest and get loans on their digital assets. So it's the opposite of DeFi where uh, the job actually is done by companies and banks, centralized institutions. As we know it, CFI relies heavily on KYC and AML verifications, which are required by the regulations. A few more risks on using DeFi. Uh, we have the execution order, the hacking, the lack of consumer protection that was mentioned before. It, and all of these factors can result in a market manipulation if are not used in a correct way. So um, uh, the result of this is that DeFi is a very risky, um, especially as we are using a new technology that basically uh, aims to disrupt the original, uh, traditional, established financial system as we know it today. We have uh, the threat of fraud and crime, uh, where this, this is a continued threat to the financial system. And uh, as we know it, where decentralized uh, finance is used, the threats are more uh, prominent. So it's a fact that there are risks and challenges associated with centralized authorities uh, controlling personal information and confidential data. Uh, for example, powerhouses like governments and banks, they have the dominant control of our information and our data. And uh, also in order to end profits and higher returns, banks are using our information and they have the complete control of our data. So what happens with DeFi is that DeFi on the contrary offers a new promise with an internet connection and smart device being used. And those are the only requirements basically with which you can easily gain access to a global financial market. So we will now look into a short comparison be between uh, centralized finance and decentralized finance. We have the features of CFI uh, towards the features of DeFi. So using a traditional crypto exchange, for example, Binance, a user will send its funds to the exchange to manage them online. Though funds are stored on an exchange platform, they are kept outside of the user's custody. So that carries a risk. On the other hand, customers on the centralized exchange do not mind sharing their data or their information because they think that these platforms are trustworthy. Uh, the conversion between, uh, we have the flexibility of fiat conversion. The conversion between cryptos and fiat usually requires a centralized uh, entity. And this is something in favor of the centralized finance. We have also the cross-chain services, and this is a significant benefit for centralized finance because many of the frequently trade coins exist on independent blockchains, and they do not implement the, the standards, basically, of interoperability. So the system is regulated through exchanges in centralized finance. DeFi, on the other hand, is uh, technology independent. So we have here a few more differences between those two. Centralized exchange supports cross-chain exchange for multiple currencies, thus displaying interoperability of cryptocurrencies. We have CFI, which exchanges also enable the conversion of fiat currency to cryptocurrency and vice versa. Decentralized finance, it is permissionless. And the method of exchange of the two finances, basically it's the main difference between the, those two. So now an important uh, matter here, which is regulation. 
uh, and in anticipation of a potential regulation, basically, it's likely that many DeFi platforms will accelerate their attempts to become truly decentralized by dissolving the links between the individuals and their platforms. So the path forward may be unclear, but it will certainly be important for DeFi investors to monitor any regulatory developments in the sphere. So uh, an important player as it concerns the regulation uh, will be the G7, and also which is backed up basically by the FAT, the Financial Action Task Force. Uh, the FAT argues basically that DeFi platforms are not as decentralized as they claim to be. Uh, because they have at least one person, one individual, or one legal person behind it, which is controlling uh, the data and information. And in this way, it may fall under the definition of a VASP, a virtual asset provider. So the FAF's guidance, it offers jurisdiction a framework to use when deciding how to regulate DeFi. And it's likely that this guidance will trigger some legal issues, legal discussions across jurisdictions um, that will also involve regulators of different states. Uh, on a national level, we have the AML uh, directive, the fifth AML directive, um, where the, it has already addressed basically regulation, it has already addressed the questions for crypto service providers and cryptos. Um, and it governs those activities. Now, the conclusion around the subject is that both decentralized and centralized finance, they aim to achieve the same goal, but in a different way. What differentiates the two is the way they carry out their objectives. So uh, on, the one way, on the one hand, they plan to make crypto trading popular and improve the trading volume. CFI promises security of funds and fair trade on those funds, where DeFi provides a space for investors to implement their strategies without having to deal with any intermediary. How can we help you? How can AGP help you? So we offer advisory services, compliance support services, legal services, and everything that you will need in establishing your crypto asset business. Thank you very much for your attention today. Right, give it up for Mihaela Grigoriu, everyone. Amazing, amazing presentation. Mihaela at AGP Law. Brilliant. All right, okay, we're very close to the lunch break, guys. But before that, we have one more panel, and this panel will capture your attention. It's not about regulation, as many people might think it's boring. It's about NFT and metaverse, okay? Creating avatars online. I still can wrap my head around it. Why some NFTs are so ugly and pixelated, and uh, why some avatars are so badly dressed. Okay, but apparently this is a new trend and that's why we're here today and tomorrow to learn about these things. So uh, I will invite Alexander Gold... Goldibin, sorry, founder at iLogos, chairman on board. Alexander, let's give it up for Alexander. Alexander, uh, would you like a uh, mic? Yeah, I would like to have a There you go. There we go. So, what are we going to talk about today? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, hi everyone, guys. Uh, <laughs> I changed the topic a bit, so we're going to talk a bit more about the practical things and not about so much theory and some visionary stuff, which can be sometimes very weird. And uh, I will talk also about it in the panel, which is going to be taking place in about two hours. Um, so. This talk is more about what are the common challenges in the current NFT and blockchain gaming landscape and how is it actually possible to overcome them. As a and short metaverse as well, right? A little bit. I will also talk about the metaverse you right. know, later in the panel and why I don't like this term. But, but this is a, a totally different you know, subject. So today it's going to be more the focused on NFT and blockchain gaming. Uh, mm. So first of all, let me ask you, uh, please raise your hand who is actually actively developing a blockchain game or maybe has developed already a blockchain game. Okay, not so many. Okay, uh, then I will actually make it a, a bit differently and just introduce you a bit into what the blockchain games are. 
in the NFT games. Um, so first of all, just a couple of words about me. I'm in uh, games professionally since roughly 20 years. Um, I'm playing games uh, since more than 35 years. So I actually started to play games as I was very young. And so all of the gaming platforms, consoles, actually pretty much everything. And among others, I've uh, co-founded iLogos Game Studios, my primary business and my primary company right now. Plus, just recently co-founded Play to Earn Limited, which is solely focused on the blockchain gaming. So we create our own IPs uh, specifically in this space. So uh, just a couple of words about iLogos. Uh, as you can see, we are since a long time in the game development as a service company. So we develop a lot of different games, work with some of you know well-known brands like Ubisoft, EA, Activision, uh, Scopely, and many, many others, Sony. Uh, and uh, also recently, <laughs> we started actively with the development of uh, NFT and blockchain games. And I will show just a few slides about some case studies. So let's start with this slide. I think it's actually <laughs> one of the most important slides out of the entire presentation because it can just showcase you two very important facts. So on the, on the left side, you see the gaming market uh, in total. So it's a huge market, obviously. One third of the world's population play games. It's a massive figure. As I started playing games, there were maybe, uh, I don't know, a few millions of people on Earth who actually played games. So now it's a few billions of people. Uh, and the total gaming market is valued at about 180 billion in the last year which is a massive figure uh, and it's, uh, it's, it still grows uh, further and further. And on the right side, you see the blockchain games market. So it's a very tiny market, uh, you know, in terms of the user numbers, just about 1.5 million people who uh, are playing, you know, um, uh, blockchain games actively. But the total market capitalization is about 22 billion US dollars. It's actually it's a fresh figure from coin market cap just from a few days ago. Uh, so it changes obviously <laughs> depending on, on many factors. But right now it's about 22 billion. And now um, also some of the uplifts uh, in this market. As you can see, a lot of money was invested and still is being invested on, on the daily basis in the in this you know, area, in this space. Uh, and uh, the trading volume is also massive. It's about 23 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, and this took off basically in the last year. So even in, in, in 2020, it was actually a tiny figure. So now it's a massive figure. As you can see, it's rapidly taking off. Uh, so now let's talk about the challenges. The challenges are right now quite massive in many different regards. I've put actually five sectors here. Um, so it's about the market technology, marketing development, and the actual games. The market itself is tiny uh, with you know the user numbers that, that are currently uh, visible. Uh, and it grows, but it grows very, very slow. Why that? We, we're going to talk about it as well. There are a lot of scam stories, a lot of scandals, a lot of theft, a lot of bugs, a lot of hacks. It's a very complex topic, which causes still a lot of you know, problems. And this also affects the negative opinions in the game industry. It's mostly negative. About 70% of players uh, out of all the mainstream players, they actually hate this very subject of NFT and blockchain gaming. And they think that it's going to be very evil, so to say. So yeah, that's uh, something that we all need to deal with. And uh, slowly, it's getting better and better. And also in the game industry, a lot of indie developers especially, they totally hate uh, play to earn and everything which is somehow related to blockchain. But they also hate free to play, so that's nothing new. Uh, but some of the biggest publishers like Ubisoft, they try to adopt it and try to get the grip on the subject. Uh, not very successful, I have to say. Most of such attempts just recently uh, failed. So some of, of big names tried them and failed. So I think there will be some kind of rethinking of the entire process how to address this subject. Uh, obviously, we have complex real-world market interactions. They are really complex. I mean, believe me, I'm in games since all my life, and it's 
completely incomparable with any of the real uh, of the uh, usual, I mean, of, of the usual game design processes, because we have so many moving parts. We have the real world economy, we have trading, we have uh, such subjects as liquidity farming and gameplay farming and, and staking and so on and so forth. So it's really crazy. For me, as a gaming guy, believe me, it's purely crazy. So now I'm kind of part of 50% of myself fintech guy, 50% of myself gaming guy, which adds a lot of complexity. And the unloyal uh, liquid. Uh, you know, liquidity, what do I mean by that? Um, usually, if a player starts playing a game, he or she is, you know, quite loyal in terms of that he or she keeps playing and having fun. But in blockchain 